Okay. So, uh, dear audience, hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Julia Plaxnana, and I will help to coordinate our today's session on gas. Thank you again for joining us today. So, before we move to the main part of our session, uh, to the presentation and also to, and also to the panel discussion, uh, there are a few housekeeping points I would like to cover from my side. So, at the bottom of the webinar screen, you should see a toolbar. You can use your toolbar to access to a range uh, number of applications, such as webinar materials, technical support, or, for example, if you would like to complete a survey. So, if you click on the application, it should open on your screen. So, all applications are resizable and movable, so please feel free to move them around to get the most out of your screen space. So, if you have any questions to our speakers or moderator, please submit your questions using the Q&A box, and we will try to answer all those questions at the end of the webinar. For the best view and experience, we highly recommend to pause all other programs and also browsing sessions running in the background. A recording itself will be available uh, within the upcoming few days. You will receive an email with the recording. Uh, we really value your feedback, so please complete uh, a survey, uh, a pop-up survey on the right side of your screen. And also, if you would like to uh, know more on how to manage gas risk and if you're interested in definitive data, please also complete a pop-up survey during our webinar and also on the right side of your window. Uh, and last but not least from my side, may I please also ask you to let us know if you can hear us by writing uh, yes, we can hear you in this Q&A box and send it to us and send in uh, the, your answer to us. Thank you again for joining us today and over to Daniel Garay, CEO of Central Eastern European Gas Exchange. Thank you again for joining us today and hope you will enjoy our session. Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia, and uh, hello for everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy um, to have this opportunity to talk to you and have this uh, 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 webinar uh, together with you. Um, it's great to, great to see so many uh, attendees again after uh, yesterday, and really uh, I hope that uh, the next uh, uh, kind of uh, joint workshop we have is going to be more in uh, in, uh, in in person uh, and not maybe not over um, online uh, facilities. But um, um, coming back to you after yesterday's uh, 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 workshop, I think it was quite an interesting one. Uh, with uh, Hubex and and we tried to cover uh, a big part of the of the uh, uh, power uh, segment and commodity, in, especially in this region. And now we have ambitious goals for for today. We we try to do the same more or less with gas as well. Um, firstly, uh, we, we try to basically combine a little bit. Uh, um, both the global uh, outlook on 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 the gas commodity and also. Um, um, Drawing some some uh, consequences on the on the regional aspect as well. Uh, why we have uh, and why we think it's important to, to to have this workshop now together and 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 why we think that the uh, the exchanges can can uh, uh, play a significant role in in the coming years in in the region is uh, due to more several reasons and one of them is that uh, we have significant market developments. Um, uh, both on power and 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 and, and gas side, um, many of those uh, market developments around us in in our region in Hungary um, show that uh, that uh, in, in one direction that 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 uh, the market can can really boost up and and develop fast in the in the next uh, um, couple of years. And also another factor, factor that um, that uh, is obviously due to the COVID, uh, it's very very difficult to avoid uh, this topic. But we saw that um, as the first wave of COVID basically went uh, through, um, the energy markets more or less survived quite quite good, I would say. But definitely, what we can expect from from the second and third waves and and and, and the later impacts of the COVID. Is uh, some some credit issues uh, or the whole market not only in, in energy but basically uh, basically in any kind of industry and that's what we we expect and we uh, we believe that 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 that's, uh, very probably that can happen uh, in our region as well and 
when it comes uh, um, into reality, the exchanges um, uh, um, have a very uh, huge role and, and, and impact on that market because obviously the, uh, uh, the the credit risk is one of one of the um, one of the biggest uh, advantages. The, the well managed credit risk is one of the big advantages of the of the um, exchanges. So, um, uh, just uh, touching on that, I'm, I'm 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 ready to to hand over to word word to um, to Gergely Molnar to have our uh, uh, have a presentation from from his side and then. We will have the panel together and try to cover, like I said, both uh, the global and, and regional aspects of uh, what he's going to show to us. So, Greg, uh, uh, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, good morning. My name is Gergely Molnar. I'm a gas analyst within the Gas, Coal and Power Markets Division of the International Energy Agency. And first of all, I would like to Thank you to the organizers for inviting us. It is a great pleasure to be here today. And let me start with some uh, good news and with some less good news. Um, the very good news is that, as we say in Hungarian, meaning that we need only to sleep one more night before our next quarterly gas report is uh, released. And I invite all of you to discover this free of charge product on our website ia.org. The last good news is that because our report is published tomorrow, I obviously can't unveil all the key findings of it today. So my suggestion would be um, to use today's presentation as an appetizer and take a look back to the last heating season and then to dive into a more forward-looking discussion during our panel. The presentation itself is divided into two main sections. First, a brief overview of global gas market dynamics, followed by a special focus on the European gas market. This slide uh, shows the evolution of natural gas demand across key gas regions, including the US, Europe, the Asia Pacific, and Russia, all together covering approximately 60% of the global gas demand. Of course, in the report, we have a much greater and more detailed coverage. Natural gas consumption fell by an unprecedented 4% in the first half of 2020 due to a combination of mild winter, weather in Q1, and COVID-19 induced lockdowns in the second quarter. And what we can see on that chart is that the gas market started to show the first signs of recovery already in the third quarter of the year. Part of this has been driven by coal to gas switching dynamics in Europe, the US, as well as in some markets of the Asia Pacific region, supported by record low gas prices. In our recently released Global Energy Review, we estimate that coal to gas switching led to a 58 million ton reduction in carbon emissions from the power sector in 2020. The combination of cold winter weather, lower nuclear availability, and gradual recovery in economic activity led to a strong demand growth through the 2020-21 heating season. In the Asia-Pacific region, China's gas demand grew by over 15% through the heating season. Part of this has been supported by the continued coal to gas conversion in the residential sector and a strong rebound in industrial gas demand. In Europe and Russia, most of the, of the demand growth resulted from higher space heating requirements. In contrast with other regions, natural gas consumption in the United States declined by almost 4% year-on-year, -year, despite of core temperatures driving up heating demand. The decline reflected gas-fired electricity generation losing ground on higher fuel prices, with gas burn of power generation declining by 7.5% year-on-year over the winter. So how did global gas trade evolve? If we look at the first half of the chart, we can see that pipeline supplies in dark blue reacted first to the demand contraction in 2020, followed by a decline in LNG exports 
falling by approximately 7% year on year in the third quarter due to a combination of shut-ins induced by historically low market prices and both planned and unplanned outages. As a result of um, the recovery in, in gas demand, both in Europe and Asia, global gas trade returned to positive growth during the heating season by increasing approximately 4%. This has been largely driven by the recovery in pipeline imports into Europe, uh, by lower pipeline flows from Central Asia to China have been compensated by the ramp up of the power of Siberia pipeline. In contrast, LNG trade remained subdued, increasing by less than half percent over the heating season due to ongoing capacity outages in Australia and Norway, gas supply availability issues in Indonesia, Trinidad and Tobago, and a temporary disruption of energy production in the US during the big freeze in February. This in turn led to tighter supply demand fundamentals. And of course, prices have closely reflected those changing market dynamics. The sharp drop in natural gas demand in the first half of 2020 led to a collapse in prices which plummeted to decay lows across all major gas consuming regions. And then looking at the second half of 2020, the story is quite different with all gas benchmarks recording strong gains through the third quarter, supported by demand recovery, supply adjustments, and unplanned outages. During the heating season, all regional gas benchmarks averaged well above last year levels, while sporadic cold spells in Northeast Asia and the United States propelled regional spot prices to historical highs. As we can see on the chart, Asian energy spot prices climbed to over $30 per MMBTU by mid-January, breaking the record price levels seen in the aftermath of the Fukushima accident in 2011. And just a month later, Henry Hub prices rose close to $24 per MMBTU, highest real price since 2003. And we will discuss the anatomy of these spikes in greater detail in a minute. And just uh, one word on the forward curves, um, the tight spreads between Asian spot energy and TTF potentially indicates that competition for summer energy is now heating up. So what has been driving this infamous Northeast Asian price rally? Well, first of all, Northeast Asian gas demand grew quite strongly between mid-December and early January. In China, gas demand was up by close to 20% through the second half of December as a result of a cold spell by pipeline imports from Central Asia have fallen below last year levels. Consequently, Chinese buyers had increased purchases of LNG on the spot market. In Japan, colder than average winter temperatures were combined with lower nuclear availability down by almost 60% year on year, which drove up gas fire generation, increasing by over 10% year on year in December. And in Korea, cold weather together with lower coal fired power generation, which has been limited due to environmental reasons, supported gas burn in the power sector up by 10% in January. So how did this additional LNG demand was met in the region? We see that it increased by approximately 10% between um, mid-December and mid-January. Now, this increase in LNG import requirements coincided with outages at regional liquefaction plants, including in Australia and Indonesia, leading buyers to call on more distant suppliers, in particular from the United States. And here we can see that the US in dark green provided all the incremental LNG supply to Northeast Asia during that period. And this in turn led to longer shipping routes and eventually to the congestion of the Panama Canal. As a consequence, 
mile tonnage demand went up by over 25% compared to September, while the availability of prompt vessels dried up. And charter rates um, closely reflected this tightness and climbed to historic highs of more than 200,000 per day from less than 30,000 six months earlier. One vessel was reported uh, being hired at 350,000 per day. This in turn provided further upward pressure on Asian LNG spot prices, which as we said before climbed to historical highs and to above $30 per MMBTU by early January. And while this slide um, shows how the price spread between Asian LNG spot prices and the TTF evolved um, during that, that period, climbing from less than $1 per MMBTU to over uh, 20 MMBTU by mid-January. Of course, the widening of the spread uh, drew away LNG cargoes from Europe uh, with LNG imports falling by over 40% between December and mid-January. These lower volumes of LNG have been compensated in Europe by ramping up pipeline imports and by strong storage rows, which more, more than doubled compared to last year. Without those flexibility mechanisms available to the European gas market, there would have been a more stiff competition with, with Asian LNG buyers, potentially driving up hub prices and retaining more LNG in Europe. And now let's move to Texas. As a result of the exceptionally cold weather, natural gas demand more than doubled in Texas between the 8th and the 15th of February. The power sector was the most important driver of additional demand. Approximately 60% of, of the Texan households uh, heat uh, their homes with electricity. And as such, uh, winter power demand is very sensitive to temperature changes. In turn, natural gas accounts for over 50% of the generation capacity of Texas. And it is mainly natural gas generation that meets the, the increase of uh, power demand during periods of, of, of high, high demand. Consequently, gas power demand in Texas more than tripled between the 6th and the 15th of February, leading to a demand increase of over 110 million cubic meters per day. Unfortunately, extreme weather conditions led to freezing components at gas-fired power plants and a sharp reduction in gas production due to wellhead freeze-offs, which led to a steep drop in gas-fired power generation. ERCOT, the operator of the Texan grid, announced rotating power cuts in the morning of the 15th of February, which lasted through the week with the return to normal operations announced on the 19th of February. It is estimated uh, that Texan gas production fell by 45% or 280 million cubic meters per day between the 8th and the 17th of February due to a combination of wellhead freeze-offs and power cuts. One important point to note about Texan production is that in recent years, incremental supply has been increasingly driven by shale plays with higher liquids to gas ratio. And that gas has naturally a higher risk of freezers compared to dry gas production, especially if not winterized properly. On this slide, we can see that production in the Permian Basin have fallen by more than three fold during the big freeze. Upstream underperformance 
resulted in thin line pack, which together with horsepower issues at certain compressor stations further limited the deliverability of natural gas. Over 30 pipelines issued force major notices and or operational flow orders, which effectively restricted upward dominations of shippers and as such limited incremental gas supplies to customers. This insatiable demand drove natural gas prices to unprecedented highs. As mentioned previously, Henry Hub prices rose close to $24 per MMBTU, their highest real price since the Arctic blast in February 2003. But the price volatility has been even more extreme in local, less liquid, and less interconnected hubs. Prices at key hubs in Texas, as just such as Katy or Baja, settled above $200 per MMBTU, while intraday prices at the OGT hub in Oklahoma soared to an historical record of over $1,200 per MMBTU. And last but not least, uh, let's have a closer look to Europe. European gas consumption rose by over 5% year on year during the 2020-21 heating season, driven by colder winter temperatures as a higher gas burn in the power sector and a gradual recovery in gas demand in industry. Heating degree days averaged 10% higher compared to the 2019-20 heating season across Europe's main gas-consuming regions. Distribution network consumption increased by an estimated 6% year-on-year, supported by the high space heating requirements in the residential sector. Demand growth was particularly strong during January and February, which faced several cost spells. The sharp drop in temperatures during the first half of January, together with lower wind generation, propelled European daily gas consumption to a high of 2.4 BCM per day on the 12th of February, topping the daily gas consumption levels seen during the Beast from the East episode back in 2018. Gas to power demand increased by an estimated 4% during the 2020-21 heating season. The decline in nuclear power output together with lower wind generation down by approximately 6% created additional market space for thermal generation most of which was captured by gas-fired power plants. Um, coal and lignite-fired generation remained uh, subdued and increased by a mere 1% year-on-year. And here, I'd like to highlight that Turkey accounted for the majority of incremental gas-to-power demand in Europe, uh, with its gas-fired power output increasing by 55% year-on-year, driven by lower coal and lignite-fired generation, and plummeting hydro availability down by almost 30%. And the gas demand from industry remained rather resilient, um, increasing by 3% per year in Italy and averaging at pre-crisis levels in France, while down by approximately 3% both in Belgium and Spain. Industrial gas demand was particularly strong in Turkey, where it rose by over 12% during the period between October and January. Despite higher gas demand, LNG import flows to Europe fell by almost 30% during the 2020-21 heating season. As we mentioned earlier, the widening price spread between Asian spot energy and European hub prices have been driving away energy cargoes from the European shores to Asia since the beginning of September 2020. European energy imports fell by close to 50% year-on-year in January to their lowest level 
since September 2018. European energy imports remained subdued in February before recovering close to last year levels in March. Meanwhile, non-Norwegian domestic production continued to decline, falling by an estimated 10% year-on-year. This was largely driven by the Netherlands, accounting for almost 40% of the net decline as a result of both lower Groningen output and lower production from its small fields. Norwegian deliveries remained broadly flat, increasing by less than 1%, as slower deliveries to Germany were compensated by higher flows via Emden to the Netherlands and via the Langelet pipeline to the United Kingdom. And Russian net exports to Europe had recovered to above 2019 levels already by the end of 2020 and averaged almost 20% higher compared to last year during the first quarter of 2021. Pipeline imports from North Africa rose very strongly by over 55% during the heating season, and other gas deliveries increased by close to 40% during the October-February period as flows via the TANAP and TAP pipeline systems continued to ramp up. Storage withdrawals increased by over 50% year-on-year during the heating season to meet higher gas demand. They accounted for almost 20% of total supply, up from 13% during the same period of last year. Consequently, European storage inventories closed the heating season almost 25 BCM below last year levels by the end of March. Colder than average temperatures in early April extended the heating season, forcing some of the storage sites to switch back from injection mode to withdrawals. As we are speaking, storage levels have fallen 15% below their five-year average, with inventory levels now below 30% of working capacity. Low inventory levels could translate into higher gas injection demand through the summer of 2021, providing additional market space, both for LNG and pipeline supplies, and heat up the competition between European and Asian buyers for summer LNG. I would like to uh, thank you for, for your attention. Uh, we have some concluding remarks, but uh, being conscious of time, I think that um, it, might, it might be a good time to move into our panel discussion. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, my name is uh, Bar Shagbari. I'm the Vice President of uh, Hungarian Energy Authority, and it's my uh, pleasure to be uh, the moderator of uh, today's uh, gas panel. I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Central uh, European gas and electricity market development and also big supporters. So uh, yesterday's and today's workshop uh, is, a, is a great opportunity to uh, to discuss the, the status quo and uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 the steps uh, forward for 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 the further development. Uh, to have these discussions, I have uh, uh, three uh, excellent panelists. Uh, I uh, I don't have to reintroduce uh, Greg Molnar was uh, giving the uh, the keynote uh, and also uh, Daniel uh, Garay from uh, uh, from uh, CJAX. Uh, uh, but uh, let me introduce the the third panelist Wayne Bryan who is director of uh, European uh, Gas uh, Research from from Refinity. Um, uh, just uh, uh, just a housekeeping uh, 
uh, for for the audience. I, I encourage you to uh, to send uh, your uh, questions uh, to the to the chat, and I'm trying to to follow them uh, during the discussions and 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 uh, uh, either at the end of uh, of this panel or or uh, or during. I try to to bring in uh, those to the uh, to the discussion. So that was that was uh, uh, the short introduction, and and let's uh, uh, jump into the. Uh, to the talk, so I, I suggest that that we would start from uh, some 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 uh, drawing some conclusions based on on Greg's uh, uh, pre presentation from 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 IEA. Uh, it's uh, it's clear that uh, uh, the the first three months was was uh, 2021 was was interesting uh, very much because for each month we had a. Uh, a major market disruption. Uh, so that I would uh, I would go uh, one by one, and starting with, with the, uh, by uh, by by Greg, and and I will ask uh, the panelists to 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 make a, a round and have your your views on the on the uh, uh, winter price uh, spikes. Uh, on I think we lost temporarily, um, uh, Pal. So I suggest Wayne, maybe if you can, if you can start with uh, um, uh, how you see those those uh, price spikes uh, that uh, uh, Gerge was talking about. Uh huh. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Everything good. Technically. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Um, I think yeah, as, as Greg highlighted, I think the market got caught out, uh, caught by surprise uh, over the winter period. Um, as we sort of got into the period of October, November, we were still kind of a little bit bearish. But once we saw the sort of the perfect storm of bullishness created in terms of the ramp up in uh, LNG demand in Asia, driven by the cold weather, of course, then we had uh, supply constraints, the Panama Canal. We've also had quite a lot of outages in the LNG market. And I think that sort of rise a lot of people out and we saw prices rise to that record. And I think the main thing what we saw in comparison to Q1 last year was Europe once more. In the wrong way, it was balancing because we saw uh, the Asian market take away most of the cargoes that were destined uh, for Northwest Europe or Europe in general. Uh, and that just drove the supply crunch, driven by colder conditions as well. But luckily in Europe, we have great infrastructure in terms of storages, unlike Asia, uh, where they don't really have the storage capacity. Um, so that sort of helped us get through it. And then what we saw after in terms of how the price then started to trend down uh, was driven again by the falling LNG prices. And of course, Asian demand then started to taper off. And we've since then, we've seen a strong uptick in uh, LNG deliveries uh, into Northwest Europe. I think we're up about 80 percent month on month from February to March. Uh, and we expect, of course, we'll speak about that moving forward, but we expect that to continue throughout the summer, especially when you look at the price dynamics. But it was quite interesting to see uh, prices at such levels, and it kind of no one really expected it. Uh, and, of course, with such a less liquid market, the price was able to surge uh, so high, uh, and that affected, obviously, TTF uh, and European gas hub prices as well. So that are a lot stronger than last year. For example, if you look at TTF day ahead, uh, it's been averaging around 19 euros per megawatt hour uh, thus far in April. If we go back to a year ago, that same average was seven euros per megawatt hour. So you can really see the difference uh, in market dynamics. And an even stronger difference is noted in the UK MBP, which was averaging uh, around 16 pence a therm uh, in 2020 on the day ahead for the first few days of April. That's now uh, trading at around over 50 pence. So again, big differences in the market. And of course, storage levels are now going to be the main concerns. Um, I think even I think two days ago, I saw Gazprom stated that we're going to need a 57% increase uh, in injections into storage over this season, which would be the largest we've seen over the last 10 years. So yeah, the, what happened in Asia creates some interesting dynamics uh, in Europe as well.
Yeah, I think uh, just yeah, just one uh, addition from 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 my side. I can obviously more cover the the regional aspects, but but um, yeah, what, what, what we saw uh, um, and what what Gergely was basically talking about is 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 that what we can see is the impact of of gas becoming and transforming into into a kind of um, um, a global commodity rather than uh, regional um, uh, rather than a sum of regional commodities and um, and 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 of course the form of of being this transformation is is, is mostly the lng and uh, we also see in our region that uh, um, that uh, lng is getting more and more important and has more and more impact on on uh, on um, the gas prices even even in 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 our region and uh, uh, especially now with the new um, uh, start of the new new uh, LNG terminal in Croatia in Kruk, what we, we we saw there during those um, uh, price spikes is uh, obviously this, the, 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 these impacts that that Gerge was talking about were more or less the same here. We saw many of the cargos rerouted from uh, from um, from Croatia to um, uh, to Asia. Um, and and obviously that was that was due to the, uh, the price differences because still, still uh, even though the LNG terminal is there in in Croatia and now we can say that our region is more connected to this global uh, flow of gas still uh, it would be exager exaggerating to say that uh, that our region is very dependent on LNG at the moment it can change in in in, in the future but our region is still more dependent on on, on and, and linked to TTF. Um, um, and obviously to uh, to Russian uh, Russian gas as well. Yeah, I agree. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. you make a make, you make a, yeah, I agree. You make a a good point, Nell, in terms of the the markets now of sort of global gas markets have kind of harmonised, and we've seen in if you look at the price curves, you can see the tightness now in these markets. So yeah, completely agree with you there, and that will continue. And welcome back. Okay, uh, so, okay, sorry guys. I, I it seems that I had some technical uh, difficulties. I'm not sure where you uh, where uh, uh, I I lost you. But the first uh, round of questions was to comment for the uh, uh, for this winter price spike. So I just asked that uh, uh, that uh, Greg, Wayne, and Daniel, if you could comment on it. I'm, I don't know. Uh, uh, what happened? So please, uh, please continue with with, with this lot. Uh, yeah, we, 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 <laughs> we did more or less. So we, we understood your question. We lost you, the connection at the very end of your question. So uh, we, we we started to answer, and and uh, basically Wayne and myself uh gave some some thoughts about it. I think it's 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 Gergay's turn now. If uh, if you want to react on that, Gergay. Yes, no, just to add uh, what you already said, I think what is very interesting is to see the increasing interfluence uh, of regional gas markets. Uh, I, I think that that last year there had been an interesting uh, debate among experts if the strong correlation we see between Asian spot energy prices and TTF, is it something which is, you know, you only to the oversupply we have seen on the market. And obviously now uh, the picture is very different in 2021. We are not anymore in a structurally oversupplied uh, global gas market. At the same time, if we look at uh, the correlation between uh, JKM and TTF on the forward curve, both for the summer contracts and uh, for the winter contracts, we see a correlation which is about 0 0.99. A uh, couple of years ago, um, the correlation between TTF and some of the less liquid hubs in uh, Central and Eastern Europe or in, in Southern Europe was less than that. And, and it really shows uh, how these far away from each other markets are interacting closely uh, with each other and how the supply demand fundamentals in one market can influence uh, the pricing dynamics in, 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 an, in a different region. Uh, 
So I, I, I think that, that this is a structure change which might stay with us for the next uh, couple of years. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for commenting for, for, for this round. Uh, let's now jump to, uh, to, to, to February, the Texas freeze. Um, uh, Greg uh, developed very well the, uh, the gas side of, of the situation. Um, the, the electricity side was, was lightly touched uh, yesterday, but it seemed that it was, uh, 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 it was quite serious as, as 2 million households were left without uh, uh, electricity uh, uh, heat for, for several, uh, several days. Uh, and and the prices jumped uh, to, to to super highs. Uh, what is not clear to me, and I'm asking this to uh, you uh, from Wayne. Uh, what do you think? Was it rather uh, a, a gas side issue, or was it rather an electricity issue? And and what can uh, uh, market participants and and potentially uh, regulators uh, draw, if any lessons could be could be drawn from from this situation? Uh, because I'm I'm not sure that the markets uh, worked uh, um, uh, well in 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 this situation. They work, but it was it was very unusual how how they work. So, what's your view on that? Well, I think, like you said, I think the key word is unusual. I think the, what we saw happen there, down to infrastructure and equipment, I think a lot of that wasn't aren't used to such low temperatures in that region. And with that, that sort of exacerbated the situation even more. And I think lessons to learn is, is, is infrastructure, really. I mean, it really drove not just the power prices, but I saw some of the gas prices on a regional basis. Uh, and they were absolutely skyrocketing. So I think... And it's, it's, it's the infrastructure side of it. And I was reading that some parts of that infrastructure would take two to three to four weeks to sort of freeze out before that could happen again. And I think what you saw in terms of the spike in demand was unprecedented. So I think there'll definitely be lessons learned. But I don't think that impact probably would have been as strong in other parts. Like, for example, uh, in Southeast Europe, I think there's a lot more stronger infrastructure and, and a used to lower temperatures and a better infrastructure. However, again, we can... We can all learn from what happened uh, in Texas. But it was such an unusual event that the, the actual effects that we saw uh, were quite surprising. Um, so I think there will be a lot to learn from it. But if you look down to the key point of it, a lot of that was down to the infrastructure. And they were unable to really cope with that surge uh, in, mm -hmm. in demand. Um, and that's what, why we saw prices uh, rally so quickly. But if you look how fast they come off, it kind of... That gives you another idea as well that next time they need to be a lot more um, prepared to offset this sort of price spike because at the end of the day, the end users are the ones that paid for this. Uh, and that's, that's, that really is the key point. There were some really increases uh, in costs for that period. So, yeah, definitely uh, okay. lots to learn. But like, like, you, like I said, it was kind of very one-off and usual event in terms of temperatures at that level. So it's not something they've experienced before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, now let's uh, let's jump to to, to March, uh, and I see that there is a, a question from the audience from Daniel uh, uh, Tariani uh, regarding the uh, uh, Suez uh, Suez Canal situation, which was not covered by uh, by Greg's presentation. I understand that. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, for the global LNG market, it was not a big deal uh, because it was uh, uh, it was not very very long, if, six days, if I'm not not mistaken. Uh, but my question is that uh, that uh, is it is the story really did that simple? Uh, what what could have happened if uh, if uh, uh, if 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 the situation would be for for more than a month? Uh, then, um, then, then uh, there could be any ramification for for the LNG market. And uh, I know that uh, that the natural answer, the safety net, is to go around uh, the Cape. Um, but uh, 
uh, yeah, but my, my question is that uh, that uh, is, is is the story so simple that that uh, okay we are lucky this time not not a big deal uh, happened uh, or 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 there there is some more. Um, let me ask uh, Greg and Wayne to comment on that. Uh, yeah, I'm happy okay. just to get. Oh, sorry, after you, Greg. <laughs> no, no, please, please go ahead. I was just going to say that in terms of the LNG market uh, and for Europe in general, what we saw in terms of the Suez Canal, uh, the effect was quite minimal. Uh, the prices didn't react quite quite a lot, as volatile as we could have been. But as you rightly said, I think it's timing is the issue here. It was only six days. Uh, majority of the tankers were container ships. There was only a couple of LNG cargoes that did get affected. I think one of those came into the UK uh, yesterday or the day before, so some slight delays. If it would have persisted, uh, then yes, we would have seen a lot more upside in prices. However, we're still seeing a little bit of disruption from it because of uh, the loading slot. So all of these ships have different loading slots, and that delay has created a bit of an issue in terms of slots. However, the price uh, in Europe didn't really react massively to it, uh, and I think if it would have dragged on for another month, two months, then we would have seen some real uh, disruption because of the journey times, the additional costs in terms of fuel and the safety issues in going around the Cape of Good Hope. So I think we were lucky. Uh, it was only a short term disruption, I think. But yeah, I think for next time, if we did see it uh, extend in terms of the period of the disruption, I think all of the rerouting around the Cape of Good Hope and other routes would have caused significant delays and price spikes to the market. So we got away with it, I think, in that instance. I fully, fully agree. Uh, with, with that, maybe just uh, to add to the symbolism of the event, uh, that you have a giant uh, ship tagged as evergreen, <laughs> uh, which is sort of uh, blocking fossil fuel trade. And, and when it comes to to, to LNG, I think it is um, just just to put into perspective uh, what is the significance of the of the of the Suez. It uh, approximately eight percent of global LNG trade uh, transits uh, via Suez, and uh, when we look at for the importance for for the European gas market, it is approximately uh, twenty five percent of the LNG which is which is sourced um, via via Suez. Now, I, I think that, that if, for instance, this uh, situation would have uh, lasted for, you know, one month, for instance, what would that mean to, to global LNG trade? I think that it would uh, translate into suboptimal uh, shipping uh, routes because, uh, you know, it takes you, for instance, approximately... 18 days uh, to reach the port of Rotterdam from uh, from Brasgas. Uh, and if you need to go uh, through the Cape of Good Hope, it would take you approximately uh, 30, 32 days. Um, so obviously this, you know, will uh, drive up my tonnage demand in a very short uh, period of time, which would again translate into higher charter rates, which will weigh on uh, LNG prices. I think that that uh, another important point here is that this occurred, this event occurred um, in a time which is considered already as uh, the beginning of the shoulder season in, in many LNG markets. It is not too cold anymore, but it is uh, not too hot yet uh, to turn on the aircon. So I would imagine that the reaction of the markets would have been very different if this uh, nice evergreen ships uh, blocks the transit, let's say, uh, in December or in January uh, amidst a court spell. I think that, that the markets would have been much more nervous, um, not only because of the physical deliverability, but ju just because I think that it would make uh, risk management much more difficult on a short-term basis. Okay, thank you, thank you for for uh, commenting, uh, uh, Wayne and, uh, and 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 Greg. Uh, so April, uh, no market disruption yet, uh, and uh, 
the good news is that uh, in in some countries we are starting to to see the the light at the end of the tunnel regarding regarding the pandemic. Uh, but for for the pandemic, let me have let me have a, a, a question. Uh, after a short lived uh, shock in last spring. Uh, uh, the gas uh, gas markets turned out at the end of the way uh, they surprisingly uh, resilient uh, because during the shock the prices went went really really down uh, in Europe we have seen uh, uh, TTF uh, minus prices not just for spot prices but also for long term uh, markets uh, meaning of uh, uh, under under two dollars per MMBTU which is really really unusual. Uh, but now the, the prices are back in the range of uh, five, uh, seven dollar per per MMBTU. Uh, so the, the the question to to Daniel that uh, what what do you think that uh, uh, will we see again TTF minus prices in uh, in uh, in LNG in in uh, in Europe? So uh, will it be? Uh, to uh, to pipeline prices to put it in a uh, in a simple uh, simple way and uh, the same uh, uh, question goes to uh, Wayne and Greg but in a way that now as the the, the prices are in in their their more normal range uh, then do you think that these uh, the current uh, market levels give uh, signal uh, to uh, to the projects which have been delayed due to the to the pandemic. Now I'm thinking about some upstream projects uh, and uh, and infrastructure projects which uh, uh, which 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 has been uh, uh, going on for for some months. That what will happen with them mostly in, in the US, but also some uh, in, in in some other countries. So now, now this time I would I would ask uh, 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 Daniel, Wayne, and Greg. Okay, yeah. Regarding the prices, of course, uh, I would say yes, uh, because because obviously anything uh, can happen, and, and 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 having LNG prices even in the region lower than than TTF, I think it can happen, and it can even happen irrespectively of of. Uh, uh, of COVID situation is just the market um, uh, demand and supply um, uh, question at the end of the uh, end of the day. What is um, important and what we what we saw regarding the, um, uh, the both the COVID situation and also the, the regarding the, the prices uh, in our region that we we see signs that somehow uh our region uh, and and the flow in our region is changing and it's not only due to the uh, uh due to the um, to the recent uh um, um covid situations but it's it's more like can be considered as as a trend as well um and it's also due to to the uh, infrastructural uh, changes and developments in, in our region and um, and obviously that's why uh, for example uh, like uh, we saw so uh, uh, in the past, which was earlier very, very unusual and, and unexpected that Hungarian prices went below TTF and went below even uh, the Austrian VTP prices, which showed basically uh, uh, it, it was due to, to many factors. Uh, and and um, uh, some of the factors can be linked to the to the COVID situation as well, uh, but 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 most of it is is more due to um, due to um, um, significant changes in 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 the regional flow, like with the Ukrainian transit uh, uh, situation can influence that. The LNG terminal in Croatia can influence have a, have an impact on that, and also also the um, the flows from uh, from from Serbia to our region uh, starting from uh, this October can have very can have a very significant impact. On that. So I think what is for our region is is an important question is whether these uh, future uh, infrastructural changes can really change the whole uh, flow and 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 uh, the, the flow of the gas in the region and and yeah the, the, the even the name of the game a little bit uh, 
Thank you. I'll, uh, I, I can give a, a view now in terms of uh, prices. I think I personally, I'm going to have to disagree with you here. I don't think we're going to see uh, TTF prices where they were last summer. Um, if you look at the, the forward curve now, that also insinuates that. I think this year going into, well, we are into the summer season now, you've got to look at European gas balance. You've got to look at the decline in Dutch production. You have to note that the transit contract between Russia and Ukraine was obviously shortened, so that's going to have an impact. You've got very strong maintenance uh, this summer uh, on the NCS and the UK. Um, and, of course, we've got depleted storage inventories. Uh, now, for me, I think until we get all the market views storage levels to be at an acceptable rate, I don't see how the price can fall to such levels. And, I mean, we are going to see a rebound in LNG, especially from the US. We have their utilisation rate at about 80 percent this year. So we're not going to see these 160, 170 cargo cancellations we saw last summer. So for me, unless you think storages are going to be full by the end of Q2, uh, which we don't personally here at Refinitiv, in terms of our forecast, we see the storages not being really heavily filled until sort of Q3. And if you look at the price spreads now, you can kind of get, you can kind of see that might be the way it outturns. If we do see a lot of LNG come on more than we expect, Perhaps we can see some lowering prices, but if you look at the price now, like I mentioned at the top of the show, um, I, if you look at the TTF now, it's averaging 19 euros per megawatt hour at the start of this month on the day ahead, compared to 7 euros uh, at this time last year. So to, to fall f to such lows, I think, is going to be a challenge. But as you said, in this market, you can never be surprised. Things can always happen that you don't expect, but... Personally, I don't, really don't see them levels, uh, price levels, unless the storages are full uh, at a much earlier point than looks possible uh, at the moment. And even now, if you look at the weather, it's still quite cold. We're actually withdrawing from storages uh, over the last week or two. Uh, and we're still going to see these temperatures persist uh, below seasonal norms at least sort of next week. And even further along, looking at some of the longer range forecasts, temperatures are still uh, quite low. So it's going to to support higher heating demand than we have seen. And in the last week or so, if you look at heating demand in several countries across Europe, it's above the three-year average. So uh, until we start to see uh, prices soften at start now, then we won't see such levels by June, July, I do not think, personally. I'll see what Greg thinks uh, of that. No, no I, I, I was thinking to comment maybe on, on the second uh, part of, uh, of uh, Paul's uh, question on is this current uh, range uh, we have in terms of prices uh, about uh, around seven dollars per mm BTU is it sufficient um, to trigger new investment into into infrastructure and I think that that when we look back to 2020, uh, we had only one uh, LNG product uh, being uh, sanctioned, Costa Azul, in, in Mexico. At the same time, we had about 200 BCM uh, capacity and the product capacity being either delayed or cancelled. This year, I think that uh, the situation is slightly different. Uh, first of all, we have seen that uh, LNG contracting is again heating up, uh, which, which I think is, is uh, also an encouraging sign from, for some of the project developers. And we have seen also that FIDs are returning. Um, we have seen uh, Qatar Petroleum taking uh, the world's largest ever uh, in, term, in terms of uh, production capacity FID. In the beginning of the year, but we have seen also uh, Santos taking FID on the Barossa field, which will uh, help uh, extending the life of, of Darwin in Australia. And we have seen some, some other smaller FIDs. Now, I think that one important uh, change is that in the past, when we were uh, talking about investments, uh, what really mattered was your break-even cost. Um, I think that now investors and project developers will be increasingly keen on understand um, what is going to be sort of the mission intensity of the molecules being uh, produced from 
from these these uh, new production facilities. And I, I think that that sort of the competitive outlook of a project is that it's not going to depend exclusively on its break-even cost, but also on how clean are going to be the molecules which is which it is able to to deliver and and in that sense i think that uh the project uh, of Qatar petroleum is 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 quite interesting in combining energy production with cc us based uh technologies and probably will give a long term uh, advantage uh to uh, to Qatar petroleum Thank you. Let's now uh, enter into the, to the, to the regional focus. That we are now more or less at the half of our uh, uh, time uh, for, for, this, for this discussion. Uh, recently, there was a lot of infrastructure development, and, and we will see a lot of infrastructure uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Central uh, Europe and in, in Southern Eastern Europe as well. Uh, 1st of January this year, Kirk LNG, 1st of October, New Serbian uh, uh, route. Uh, last year, uh, December, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Romanian uh, reverse flow, uh, the, the Greek uh, Bulgarian uh, uh, interconnector, uh, not mentioning the uh, top, which has been also been, uh, uh, been, uh, been coming online uh, lately. So, this is this is uh, this is changing the landscape. Uh, what what do you think that uh, do these uh, do these new uh, routes or and, and, and sources will bring uh, new uh, uh, opportunities and new trading opportunities in, in the region? So let me ask uh, uh, Daniel uh, about this. You we mentioned uh, this. Uh, uh, slightly, but let me ask you and and uh, and also Wayne. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, they will definitely bring new trading opportunities, and they already do, I think. And uh, and we can see that uh, uh, obviously on on our markets, and and there are many signs uh, both uh, on, on on what we see basically on our on our own exchanges as an increased. Uh, um, uh, traded volumes compared to uh, to the same time of last year, but also um, also uh, some some price signs uh, uh, indicate this as well. Um, uh, like I said, uh, the, the, the little bit of uh, the change of uh, potentially the changing of of the flow direction in our region uh, obviously brings new uh, trading opportunities. And and what is very good for for. Um, for regional markets and 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 also for trading, if I mean there are there are obviously uh, uh, factors and necessary uh, um, uh, conditions for that, and 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 if we just start listing those conditions, we can find many of those are are met and 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 can be found in our region. Like for example, we are talking about like quite significant. Uh, uh, um, uh, size of market, which is, uh, if we consider the region, that's that's true. Uh, good, good infrastructural uh, uh, conditions. Both we have quite uh, significant storage capacities, considering the whole region, but uh, but uh, considering Hungary as well. That's that's true. Also, uh, the, the 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 new um, um, uh, cross border capacities and increased cross border capacities. These are these are impacts that. Uh, that uh, that help uh, to boost um, uh, the market and trading and and then the new thing is is not only the change of of or or not only having the the alternative routes but also having different pricing schemes behind those routes which which is also happening in our region like what you said is a good example the lng obviously our region used to be and mostly is still the case is very ttf uh, uh, linked, but 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 there are signs that that this can change in the in the short future, or at least uh, um, uh, slightly can change in the future. And 
like we have a new new pricing scheme, new pricing logic coming in with the LNG terminal, because now obviously, uh, uh, like we said, the, the global market and heavy hub and JKM are also an impact on, on our uh, prices. But also, um, uh, if, for example, I think you didn't mention, but uh, and it's maybe not in the very short future. But uh, for example, a, a Romanian upstream project, if it comes alive in the in the short future, can be obviously an, a very nice a new addition to this uh, to this region and market as well. Because again, it's it's a new route and also it's a new uh, kind of uh, pricing uh, uh, logic behind that because it's more linked to to upstream uh, costs. So this is, these are uh, the elements, the factors that can really help a market um, uh, to develop fast. And that's what we, we, uh, we are hoping in our region. We really, we really see a good potential and a very high upside on, um, on, on, on that market. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's definitely going to happen in, in, in one or two years, but um, the signs are there and, and, uh, and um, um, we are quite optimistic about those signs at the moment. Thank you. I think yeah, I think you covered most of the most important points there. And I think, like you said, the increase in interconnectability, the more available supply, increasing the LNG output. I think all these things together will allow this market to develop in a more effective way. And like you said, in terms of the just being pegged to TTF, that will start to start to change as the as the market develops a bit more. But yes, the liquidity will improve uh, on the back of this increased interconnectivity and less of a reliance on other markets. So yeah, I completely uh, agree with your points there. I think you've, you've covered that uh, very well in terms of what the expe expectations are for this market over the coming years. And I think the more you get uh, these interconnections between these markets, the more coupling we're going to see uh, a better impact in terms of pricing, uh, especially on the li liquidity front, because that to me is one of the main things. Increased li liquidity really shows a more developed market. Yeah, over the next few years, I think the prospects uh, are quite bright. Uh, for this market in terms of catching up uh, with some of the more liquid European hubs. Thank you. Uh, there are two questions uh, regarding uh, Nord Stream 2. So then uh, in this round, I would ask you to, to, uh, uh, to comment. Uh, uh, how, how I would phrase the question that... Uh, uh, it seems that in this region, the uh, uh, the transit patterns are changing. Uh, the, the, the Ukrainian transit seems to be uh, seems to have a lower uh, uh, role in in the future. While from 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 north the, the North Stream, and from south from south the uh, the Turkey Stream uh, seems to be uh, taking some. Uh, some some role. I know that uh, this is a uh, uh, this is a geopolitical question. So I'm asking for uh, for the uh, 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 for for either from a market perspective. Uh, so I mean, what if it if it happens? Because uh, uh, because there are a lot of factors in in this machine. So we don't know when, how. If it happens, that how it would change the. Uh, uh the, 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 the european uh, uh, the european uh, market landscape or or or, or, or the, uh, the that does it have an impact on on, on the different hubs uh, on, on, on on the pricing so this is something which which is uh, which is which is uh, quite not, not not very clear for me that what, what will happen or how how should the new landscape look like if if it would happen. So now, let me ask to this, this to comment. Let me start with uh, with Wayne, Daniel, and and then Greg. Uh, I, I firstly, I do believe it will happen. Uh, in fact, I was reading something this morning about that on the way in. Uh, they've completed, I think, ninety five percent of it now. Um, and what they need to do is finish the last two parts of the work and the, the Danish water, the work is still ongoing. Whereas on the German side now, there's going to be a slight delay because someone's raised an objection for environmental purposes. On the flip side, you've seen the US rhetoric is still quite strong. Uh, they're still quite against it. But we know that uh, Germany as a country, they 
they need the gas, they want this. And a project that's at 95% completion will surely uh, get completed. We personally, we've been looking into it and trying to factor it into our outlook uh, from the summer and the winter and beyond. And what we personally here at Refinitiv think is that it will happen, but we won't likely see any commercial flows until Q1 next year, maybe the end of Q4 uh, this year. But really, we, we, didn't, we don't factor any flows uh, from, uh, from Nord Stream 2 until the start of the new year. Um, and the impact it will have is is quite good on on the hubs. You, I mean, it's it's, it's a real ramp up in uh, in gas into Europe. So I think on in terms of what impact on the market on the pricing level, obviously, it will dampen price expectations. And as soon as we get confirmation of flows, uh, I think then once we'll see that, then we'll start to see the price react. At the moment. Uh, we don't, like I said, don't foresee it until the new year. Um, but I think the America, Americans are quite strong in terms of their views on it. But I think in terms of Europe itself, I think the overriding uh, demands of Europe in terms of the gas needs, it will see the pipeline get completed. And I, think I did a presentation in Germany a couple of years ago talking about Nord Stream 2. And even then, <laughs> we were talking about it being ready the year after. But we're still here now uh, and it's still uh, nowhere near commercially flowing. So, like I said, I think we won't see end of Q4, start of Q1. And it will have a downside impact uh, on prices once this is up and running. And that will spread throughout the regional hubs, as we mentioned before, because they're now a lot more harmonised. So, yeah, I do think it, uh, it, it's going to happen, uh, like I said, at the end of this year to start next year. Uh, and it's a positive thing uh, for Europe in terms of additional gas supply, especially at the moment when we rely on other other supply. Uh, having an additional supply uh, from Gazprom into Europe will only help. Yeah, I think uh, it just reminded me when when Wynne said that 95%, sometimes when you, you know, when you install a software, for example, it very easily goes up to 95, 99%, and then it's always the last five or one percent, which is which, <laughs> which the longest and which is very difficult sometimes. And this is the case here yes. as well, I think. It's, uh, but but, but uh, Regarding the price uh, impact, I think it's very, yeah, it's very hard to say. It's more, it's more that, that, Obviously, if this comes alive, it's it's uh, something that again uh, have very big has a very big impact on 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 the flow on the on the entire European uh, uh, gas flow, and this will obviously um, uh, change prices differently in certain regions and in certain um, uh, countries. And it will be very interesting to see. Um, basically, if that comes alive, then 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 we have a very significant uh, north stream um, uh, flow and also another significant uh, flow from from the south uh, from the south stream and 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 those uh, two somehow uh, combine in 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 the central european region um, i think what it can it can bring from our perspective because because again on, on prices it's difficult to say obviously what i agree with wayne it, it, it generally has a, a downward impact on, on prices so that's what we that's what we expect as well. What it, for us is more important. It, it can really be a little bit reshape the the the, um, um, the map between the the hubs as well. Um, uh, this can happen, and, and 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 this is something we can uh, we can see already. And 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 I think we as as as, as a Central European hub, we also we would see um, uh, a potential and and uh, an and upside in 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 that project coming alive. Um, I just would like to add that um, we don't uh, necessarily comment on on private products. Um, so I, I would I would not like to um, um, to comment on on, on that. Um, and, but I guess to maybe uh, lies to the previous discussion uh, we had the build up of infrastructure interconnectors um, to and out uh, Hungary will certainly um, support uh, the growth in liquidity. I think. Another aspect is also the nature of some of the um, long-term commercial contracts, which might be signed and and 
how they uh, would would impact on on the wholesale market liquidity, which uh, could be also considered. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the question uh, I have is, uh, what what do you think of the uh, of the uh, unusual or not unusual situation of uh, of having the uh, uh, CJX uh, quotes uh, cheaper than uh, than VTP and TTF since last October, if I'm if I'm right. Uh, my question is it is it uh, since months uh, is it is it the new normal or is it something which is which is temporary for for the region and it will uh, go back upside down uh, let's make a, let's make a quick round what what do you think about this uh, uh, daniel greg and wayne <clears throat> Yeah, this is uh, the question that we are asking ourselves as well: uh, whether this can, uh, this will remain as it is, or 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 it will change um, very soon. And, and I, I, honestly, I, I think it can. Uh, uh, we can we can see like uh, a swing from time to time in that respect. Sometimes uh, we will go back to the old normal. Let's say when 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 Hungarian prices are basically uh, can be considered or can be described as uh, TTF plus something or VTP plus something. Uh, but also times when 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 this uh, turns to the opposite and. Um, and this is very uh, dependent on on what we just discussed, and very much dependent, for example, on on uh, on uh, the long-term Russian contracts uh, in the region, and also the direction of that, wh whether it comes through Ukraine or whether it comes uh, through Serbia uh, or from the Nord Stream to the region. But uh, obviously, there are uh, there are uh, fundamental reasons as well behind behind this. Uh, um, uh, Change, um, but but also some some, I would say more uh, more um, just uh, recent uh, market uh, development issues. Like for example, um, uh, at at the moment, it's simply the fact that um, the the winter summer spreads are not so um, um, so impressive uh, for the traders. Um, um, we become a little bit. Uh, Longer in our region and in Hungary, that 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 also uh, provides a slightly lower prices than than uh, than in Austria. But this again can change. Like for example, if if uh, what we saw in uh, mostly in 2019, but also in 2020, if the the the, the storage um, uh, importing gas to Ukraine for for storage reasons, if it ramps up again. It can. Uh, it will obviously change again the the the, the price differences and and will we'll provide a premium to Hungarian prices to uh, to Austria um, uh, again or to TTF again. Uh, yeah. So this 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 is um, also also um, um, a question mark for us and and will be very interesting to see and and I think. Uh, we see it as a kind of um, uh, an opportunity for our um, for our uh, markets, um, for our especially for our future futures markets uh, on, on Hudex. So if if uh, this region uh, somehow manages to to um, to become uh, uh, more um, uh, a reference uh, price in the region, then then um, obviously it will have a good uh, a nice impact in on on our uh, markets so i hope it it answers your question i know it's it's a, it's a little bit of yes or no but but that's 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 what that's what. Um, just, just to add on, on that i think that that um there is of course a question of the uh, supply fundamentals which you know might be looking a bit more comfortable um and um, now for certain Eastern Europe and, and also in particular for Hungary, where I think that, that the storage levels are around 50% full, uh, much higher than, than the, the average we have in Northwest Europe. I think that, that this is part, uh, part of the picture. Uh, but also I think that, that just the, the improved hardware 
the new interconnection, the new optionality of supply probably is also playing into that. And I think that, that a third uh, point might be uh, the legacy of some oil indexation being left in certain uh, Central and Eastern European long-term contracts, which might also uh, provide some downward pressure uh, to prices in comparison with with TTF, um, and I, I, I think that that this is sort of the combination of of, uh, of factors which which might uh, lead to that uh, discount. Uh, one interesting uh, point to note is also that one of the major exporter uh, to to Europe is uh, is of course auctioning uh, some of its gas on your on European. Um, hubs, um, and when we look at the April average uh, for the gas being auctioned on, on its platform, it is now approximately uh, 5 euro per megawatt hours uh, below TTF, um, which might be also also a component which, which plays into, into that. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, you both highlighted the sort of the, the key points there in terms of uh, the local market conditions of, of seeing the prices at a discount. But moving forward, like, like like you mentioned as well, I think what we will see as we move into the summer is the development uh, of fundamentals in Europe and how these storages are going to get filled and any other any other disruptions that can impact the price. So I, I think, like you said, I think local conditions are playing its part. But one thing I will add is Ukraine. Uh, you mentioned Ukrainian storage. Last year, they played quite an important role uh, in terms of taking away some of that surplus gas from Europe and transporting it uh, into storages there. We really don't, in our in our forward look uh, for this summer, we didn't really see Ukrainian storage playing much of a need or playing much of a part this year. Uh, and if you look at the, the spreads, that kind of insinuates that as well. But there is still quite a gas stored there at the moment, uh, which can be used. Uh, moving forward. However, uh, we don't possibly see that till probably a lot later uh, in the summer. And of course, with uh, the custom house, custom warehouse regime scheme that they've set up, it's in for a thousand days. So uh, some of these players can still keep that gas in for a lot longer, but it will still provide uh, maybe some support later on in the year. But we don't see Ukraine playing anywhere near a bigger part uh, as last year. Thank you. Uh, now we are approaching to the to the end of the discussion, uh, uh, and this is uh, this is basically about the uh, uh, Central European uh, uh, gas market development. My my question is uh, regarding CJEX. Uh, that uh, well, what 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 do you think? Where where uh, can CJEX be five years from now, or where it should be? Uh, depending on, uh, on your position, uh, can the Hupix uh, success can be duplicated or not uh, uh, in this uh, time horizon? And uh, for 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 Wayne and uh, and Greg, so what what uh, would be your your advice for for this uh, for these years or years? And what are the uh, the pitfalls to be to be avoided? And of course, to, to Daniel, to uh, to make your case, how you see uh, CJEX from five five years from now. So let's let's start with, uh, with Daniel. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, I think, um, uh, of course, I I I, um, I mean, officially, I also have to be uh, optimistic. But but irrespective of that, I'm I'm quite optimistic. We already see that uh, that. Uh, this year, both on our spot markets and and on Hudex, on our futures uh, markets, are uh, this year has been uh, uh, the best so far. And and uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, we see a very good uh, uh, volumes on, on on both markets. And obviously, we have a good example uh, within within the group uh, the group. Uh, 
for those who, who don't know, consists of Coupex uh, covering the, the power uh, spot side, CDEX covering the, the gas spot uh, uh, products, and Hudex for, for the futures uh, products, both on gas and power. So Coupex is a good example for, for us. And um, when you ask this, obviously, there are some, 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 some uh, factors that, that helped uh, Hupex in the past uh, years uh, to reach at the point where they are. And uh, some of that is, is uh, something that, that hopefully we can, we can achieve on the gas markets as well. Obviously, the, the power markets are more developed and also more interconnected. Um, and, and, and just considering the, 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 the market couplings uh, around the power markets, obviously, that's, that's a very good um, um, uh, that 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 can be a very good boost for for the market. So if that or something similar can happen on 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 the gas markets in the short future, that will that will obviously um, um, have a major impact, further impact on 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 CJX as well. But for for me, to be honest, in five years I see CJX uh, uh, a little bit still higher higher volumes uh, than now. But but really, the high upside and the big potential star player of the group, I think, is is Hudex. And uh, we really, I think, if the 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 the, uh, the region and the markets uh, develop, we will see that mostly on 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 the futures market. So if, it, it it would be a very good sign for for our market to see that uh, that the futures uh, market is is very liquid on uh, on our regions and on our markets, just like as it is on in on on on, on TTF or on DTF. But that's yeah, also sorry, just one last. One last sentence. That's also a question of of, of market design, which uh, uh, which we, we can uh, we can work on in the next couple of uh, uh, years. I would say. Sorry, Wayne. It's yours. Sorry, <laughs> I was just going to say, um, having traded uh, Hupex and Hudex in my previous role at the start and seen the development uh, in the, in both these markets, I think as this gas market starts to evolve uh, in this local area, and I think as conditions improve in terms of interconnectivity, etc and the market gains gets deeper in terms of liquidity, I think, yeah, I think the, the, the future is definitely brighter. And I think over, like you said, over the next five years, we expect the gas market to look a little bit different in Europe in terms of the infrastructure side of it, uh, especially with LNG uh, infrastructure. And I think that can only help. So I think, yeah, I think the future is uh, definitely over the next five years uh, going to be quite bright, uh, you guys. And, uh, yeah, like I said, I haven't seen the changes uh, from when I was trading power on these markets to now. Uh, there's, there's a marked improvement, so I only see the same thing happening uh, here as well. So, yeah, I think the future's quite quite bright. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe did we lose Greg? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Greg. Sure. Um, Greg, yes. you're here. Well, you I, I, can you can you Sorry. hear? Me? <laughs> yeah, I was just conscious about Weak. time. So maybe just just uh, two points. One is that um, the development and the evolution of infrastructure is key. I think that that in terms of interconnectivity, they, there might be still some untapped potential uh, when we talk between Hungary and Austria. And here, I think it is important to note that liquidity fuels liquidity. So if that interconnectivity is improved, that might have also positive impacts on, on the Hungarian uh, gas market. I think that the sort of complementarity uh, between the infrastructure in Croatia with the Kirk Energy Terminal and the vast uh, storage space in Hungary can be better used if the two markets are more closely uh, integrated. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think that, that those are important components. And when we look at the demand side, I think that in Hungary, uh, natural gas is going to play uh, an important role in terms of um, backup capacity when, when it comes to the greater share of renewables and the accelerated phase out of, uh, of lignite. Um, and in that sense, I think it will be increasingly important for market players 
to have more sophisticated risk management uh, strategies, both in the short term and in the longer term, which again might help uh, to fuel uh, trade and liquidity on exchanges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I wanted uh, dear to ask audience, some, dear. More, some more, one more question, and, and uh, uh, also there was. But I'm uh, afraid that we have yes. to close it now because the organizer yes. just uh, told that uh, that it's over. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thanking it and, and giving back to the floor to, uh, and to the organizers. My, on my side, thank you very much. Uh, we touched the uh, very important points of global and, and the regional uh, uh, regional gas market situation. And, uh, and and thank you very much for your uh, 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 for your time and that you were you were with us. So uh, that the, the, I'm giving back the, the floor to the organizer. Thank you.